I'll give you a wait to see, and it's going to be official. The Arizona Coyotes are relocating. You heard it here. They will leave Arizona. There's no saviors. Arizona can focus on the D-backs and their new ballpark that they need. They can focus on Matt Ishbia and how great he is at hugging Nikola, or they can focus on Kyler Murray getting better. Fine, but they are no longer going to be a four-sport city. Book it, Coca. Wait to see when we tell you something's going to happen. If it does, great. If it doesn't, fine. We'll revisit it because we're not like the other gas bags on the other networks. We will revisit. The Phoenix Coyotes, the Arizona Coyotes are going to relocate. Relocated. That's the nothing personal word of the day. It is Friday, April 19th, 2024. And you just heard a wait to see cash in from almost a year ago. The saga of the Arizona Coyotes is over. That's not exactly right. The saga of the Arizona Coyotes has taken another step. The Coyotes were sold yesterday officially to the National Hockey League for $1 billion. Alex Morello managed to turn a absolute franchise, a nothing, a franchise that couldn't get revenue. They were playing in Mullet Arena in front of a couple thousand people. No prospects for a new arena. No prospects for any sort of resolution of any kind. Gary Bettman is doing a Snoopy dance because he was able to get a billion point two for a relocated team. So let me explain. The NHL gave Alex Morello $1.0 billion. They then owned the Coyotes. Unlike baseball, which bought the Expos from us back in 2002 and held them for a couple years, Bettman held them for a couple seconds. He then turned around and sold the Arizona Coyotes to Ryan Smith with the agreement that they will be relocated to Utah, named the Utah Blanks, for $1.2 billion. That means that Gary Bettman got a valuation above the Ottawa Senators. The owners got to split a $200 million quote-unquote relocation fee. And Alex, the erstwhile owner, got something fascinating. The name, the Arizona Coyotes. How would that work for a deal? Do you think they, it's like when we wanted the bus during the Marlins transaction. Hey, we're not going to do it without the bus. You think Alex was saying, hey, billion dollars, but I need the IP because I want an expansion team. It's sort of like Oakland saying, if we lose the A's, we want an expansion team. And Major League Baseball saying, well, that's all fine and dandy, but where's the ballpark, Claire? But it seems as though that Morello is under the impression that he's going to get an expansion team in the next five years. Because the NHL agreed in this historic transaction to give him a five-year window to get an arena built and get an expansion team. That's sort of interesting to me. And when being done with the Coyotes, Alex actually gave a statement giving hope to the people of Phoenix, none of whom are despondent the Coyotes left because there was no political, there was no political, come on, Coca, what's the thing? Wait, momentum. I'm tired this morning. We did a live show. I'm in Pittsburgh, did a live show last night. It was fantastic. And then, of course, we're up all night because Taylor Swift dropped 31 songs. Who could sleep? When you've got 31 brand new I Love Travis songs from Taylor, I don't think it's very nice of her to drop songs in the middle of the night like that. It causes people like Sarah to stay up all night long, Lionel, waiting for the songs. But that's why maybe the brain's a little behind it. I couldn't think of the word momentum. Now I don't even know why I was saying momentum. Oh, Gary Bettman. Can we talk about, oh no, let's get to Alex's statement first. Do you mind, Coca? I'm sorry. I just want to do that. 
this is not the end for NHL hockey in Arizona. So for all of you people in Arizona who were nervous and upset, don't worry. It's not the end. It may be the end of the middle or the beginning of the end, but we're not at the end of the end. I have negotiated the right to reactivate the team within the next five years and have retained ownership of the beloved Coyotes name, brand, and logo. I don't mean to yuck on anyone's yum, but if it had been so beloved, I'm not sure the Coyotes would be in the position they're in right now, but let's just assume they're beloved. Then Alex said, I remain committed to this community and to building a first-class sports arena and entertainment district. Wait for it. Can we have some music? What's the music that you'd play before this next phrase, Coca? Some sort of dun-dun-dun. Can you hit something on the soundboard? No? Please? Okay. Without seeking financial support from the public. That was your moment, Coca. You had another chance to do it again. Just to be clear, what's now been promised is that there's going to be a new arena, a big entertainment district with no public money. <laughs> yes. God, I love Metal Arc. Look at the resources we get. What he's referring to is that he's taking place, taking part, participating in a privately held land auction. If he wins this auction, which is what Gary Bettman had been saying, we're all waiting for, but then apparently Gary Bettman couldn't wait another couple weeks because he had to get the team moved to Utah immediately. But this land auction, if Alex prevails and wins the land, which is uncertain, but if he has the highest bid, he'll get it. He then plans to build an arena and an entertainment district. Does that sound familiar? That is what owners are doing now in order to justify putting any money into an arena when it's really not a great investment, which is why you seek public money. But when you have what Atlanta has, when you have what Jerry Reinsdorf's trying to get, when you have what all these teams, St. Louis has it, all these teams are trying to get these entertainment districts, the Mets are trying to do it. He's saying that he's gonna get that done and built with no public assistance. Let me tell you the number of cities that have had an owner build an entertainment district without any public assistance. I'll wait, give me your guess. Zero. The last owner to say that he would build something without public assistance was, was John Henry in Florida to build a new ballpark, and he was run out of town because it turns out you can't do it without public assistance. Public assistance includes infrastructure. It includes running utility pipes and wires. It includes ingress, egress, anything that's done to support the district, to support this privately owned and privately profitable district. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I dig it. I like it. But why in the world would he say without seeking financial support from the public? It's idiocy, which I guess is on brand and tracks. So the Coyotes are not relocated. So we should do a different word of the day. Here we go. 469. Utah blanks. That's the nothing personal word of the day for Friday, April 19th, because that's a brand new hockey team. Well, wait a minute. Not true, because it's going to be the Arizona players who knew nothing about this until there was a meeting just a couple of days ago where the GM sat down with them and said, listen, gentlemen, I hope that you only rented in Arizona because we're going to take you all to Utah and let's start looking for housing. Don't look for alcohol. Don't look for trying to go to a bar without ordering food. But that said, you can look for multiple people in your family if you want. I'm just kidding. I love Utah. Maybe you'll see Dwayne Wade. I actually do love Utah. I love skiing there. I love going there. But when players are relocated, it's a thing. You have to involve them because think about it their entire family is moving. You may or may not bring anyone in the front office, but you clearly are bringing everyone in the traveling party is what it's called. So the players, the trainers, 
the, the therapists, the GMs, all the hockey people are going to move and they've got to find places to live. And it's not like they've got a multi-year runway. I am told I have an inside source. Her name is Sarah. And I was told that the hockey season starts in only six months. That's it. We're now in April. We haven't even started the playoffs yet. And the new season, as you know, starts in October. So there is a huge amount of work to be done prior to the season starting, not the least of which is finding a name, finding a uniform design, which normally takes years, not months. They've got to get all the apparel sent to all of the licensed retailers. They've got to start selling it. And then they've got to figure out their revenue. So we had an amazing tweet. We've got Steve Cohn part two here, by the way, Coca. Ryan Smith, he likes to tweet. And you know when owners tweet, good things happen. He tweeted out yesterday that they have 6,000 deposits for season tickets in the first two hours. And it's now up to 11,000. So I want to explain what a season ticket deposit is. You go online, you fill out your name and information, you pay a hundo, and then you have become a season ticket deposit holder, which means that you have reserved the right to buy season tickets for an unknown price. Coke and I were going to go online and we were going to buy season tickets in Utah and we were going to see where the seats are. We we're going to see how to do it. But we decided instead, we didn't want to, again, that's two yucks and two yums here this morning on a random Friday. I'm not saying that 11,000 is a bad number. That's an exciting number. But I am saying the conversion rate from deposits to actual full season equivalents is what they're called. You may know it by the name of a season ticket holder, but inside a league team, we don't call it that. It's called an FSE. What we publicly talk about are season ticket holders. What we care about are FSEs. So here's the difference. If you have 41 home games and you have one seat that is sold to four people, 10 games each, those are partial full season ticket holders because they've bought 25% of a season. We get to tell you we have four season ticket holders, but it's really only one full season equivalent. And when you're doing your projections, when you're doing your financial statements, you, do, you don't care about season ticket holders. You care about full season equivalents. So it is way better PR to announce ticket holders because you could have four, you could have five, you could have six people per seat. So 11,000 season ticket deposits does not mean they made a deposit to buy a 41 game package, which in hockey would be a full FSE. It could be a five game package. When we were building Marlins Park and we went out to get season ticket holders, we were selling all sorts of different packages. So we could say, hey, look, we have 13,000. It's still not a terrible number, but it certainly to me does not indicate that all is going to be perfect in Utah. There is no guarantee. The other business part of this transaction that was interesting is that the story they're sticking to, both Bettman and Ryan Smith, is that all of this came together like in seconds. Ryan Smith did an entire statement where he talked about how we pivoted, we were looking at expansion, but then we got a call from hockey and Gary Bettman said, hey, can you guys pull this off? The Coyote situation is going to be a little longer than we thought. I'm not sure what Gary meant by that. It's already been a half a decade longer than it needed to be. So no matter what, it's been longer than they thought. But he said it's been longer than, Gary said it's been longer than we thought. The NHL has a problem. And we said, we're ready. Do you know how hard it is to start a team in a city? And I'm not saying they won't be ready in time, but a expansion franchise, it takes 
years to get going. But this is a relocated franchise. So in theory, you can do it a whole lot faster. But even when teams relocate, they prepare for years. And the Delta Center is not ready for hockey. It's got to be fitted for hockey. There have to be upgrades made. And they are on the clock. It's going to be quite fascinating to see what goes down. But from hockey standpoint, they don't have to worry about the Arizona Coyotes anymore. Now they can just start if they want worrying about the Utah blanks. Anyone have any suggestions? Anyone? Submit your suggestions to Ryan. You may name the team. No, I don't think so. What else interested me about that? The Diamondbacks response. What happens when a team leaves? I've already told you my dirty little secret that I rooted against the Dolphins. I rooted against the Heat and I rooted against the Panthers. I admit it. When I was president of the team, I had to say the rising, the sh all ships rise with the tide. We sent out tweets and I would call at all people from other teams when they were in the playoffs. Hey, good luck. I'm thinking about you. Go get them. Win the title. Let's do it for Miami. Let's be a championship city. And it was total horse hockey. Not that I didn't like Eric or Pat with the Heat. Of course I do. Or Vinny and Matt with the Panthers or nobody with the Dolphins. I'm just saying that I want those teams to be eliminated quickly so the focus can be on the Marlins. Or I don't want the frame of reference to be how good the other teams are and how bad our team is because then we're looking worse by comparison. The Diamondbacks, in what I view as an unprecedented reaction to the Arizona Coyotes relocating to Utah. Is it the Phoenix Coyotes or the Arizona Coyotes? I'm completely blanking right now. Again, I keep getting it wrong. It's the Arizona Coyotes. Thank you, Coca. The Diamondbacks released a statement about the relocation. The entire Diamondbacks organization is disappointed in the now official news of our NHL team being relocated out of state. We firmly believe that we deserve and can support teams from each of the major sports and are troubled that a solution could not be found for all parties involved. We are sad for all sports fans and all who care so deeply about our community. Let me break that down for you, if you don't mind, because people have sent me this and have given me their view, which is the Diamondbacks must be happy that the team left. They're not sad. It's more sponsorship revenue. It's more people not spending money on hockey. We'll spend money on baseball. No, that's not what this statement is about. This statement is about getting public money. That's all it is. Ignore the beginning part of the statement. First of all, the entire Dimebacks organization, people in corporate sales, not disappointed. But just ignore that part. Go right down to the bottom. We are troubled that a solution could not be found for all parties involved. What that means is that the Diamondbacks, who are currently trying to figure out, including the fact that they had threatened a relocation, and then Ken Kendrick, the owner of the Diamondbacks, walked it back saying, no, no, we're not leaving Arizona. Don't worry. We're not leaving Phoenix. But their ballpark, which was beautiful and is now on the old side, it needs renovating or more likely they need a new ballpark. And to do it, they need to find a public-private partnership and they have not been able to do it yet. What they are saying here, if you read between the lines, is you better come to us with a deal that we like and that you can swallow or else forget being a four sports city. Realistically, you're going to be a two sports city. And this deal with the Diamondbacks has been going on for over a year. I told you back in April of 2023, we have an open wait to see that the Diamondbacks will get a new stadium deal done. And I still believe that's just over a year ago. I still believe that is going to be the case. And it is not, however, made more likely by the Coyotes leaving. It is not made less likely by the Coyotes leaving. And keep in mind, 
the Coyotes may not have left. There's no mention in the Diamondback statement at all about the fact that Morello kept the rights to the Coyotes, that he has the ability to bring a team back in the next five years if he gets an arena built. Knowing the ridiculousness of the no public support, he's going to be going after public money. So there's multiple teams going after public money. So the Diamondback statement is just disingenuous. And I love you, Derek, one of the best team presidents around. But you know that your statement could have been this. That would have been a better statement. Nothing personal pick of the day. I felt terribly for Jack Leiter yesterday. Jack Leiter, we had the Tigers over the Rangers. Jack Leiter got lit up as we said he would. What we forgot to mention is that Maeda would get lit up. And then we forgot to mention that the Rangers would win 10-7. We are 45-60 and 60 in what is just spiraling after 105 picks. We have plenty of time. We're not even halfway through the year. But it has been a tough go in baseball. There is no question about it. Maeda and the Tigers over Leiter and the Rangers is a loss. Let's talk about tonight. And it's going to be a bit of a longer topic than normal because it's not just a normal pick. I want to talk about the NBA games tonight. The NBA games are game sevens tonight. You've got the Kings facing the Pelicans. The winner advances to play the Thunder. You've got the Heat playing the Bulls. The winner advances to play the Celtics. The loser goes home, not in the playoffs. The Kings are favored by one and a half over the Pelicans, and the Heat are favored by one and a half over the Bulls. The interesting thing about that is that the Pelicans are a home dog. The Heat are a home favorite. The similarities don't end there, although I just told you a difference, but the one and a half points, you know what? Nothing's the same, except for Zion Williamson is out, not just for tonight's game, but at least the OKC series if they win. But my guess is he's out for the playoffs with hamstring issues. Jimmy Butler, out. He has an MCL sprain, out for tonight, out for the Celtics, and I would assume out for well beyond that, if not the entire playoffs. Two injuries to the two faces of those teams. Both suffered in the first of the play-in games. If an injury happens in a game that doesn't count for anything, is it still an injury? Is it like an off-season injury? You remember the play-in tournament stats aren't stats. You don't, it doesn't count for anything. I'm not sure about this, Matt. I believe that play-in stats don't even count in your career points or career rebounds or career average. I don't believe it counts in career victories for the coach. We should check on that. I'm sure that we've got an entire staff of people who are watching the show live on the Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel. Hit subscribe. Or I'm sure that there are people who are watching on the DraftKings Network 10 a.m. every day or listening to this. Let me know if I have that right, that play-ins don't count. I know in baseball, game 163, which they don't really have anymore, but game 163 is used to count for regular season stats. I don't believe playing stats do. Can we talk about the Butler injury for one quick second? What a cluster of amazing media involvement was yesterday. NBA insider Shams had the story early that Jimmy Butler had an MCL issue and that he was going to miss several weeks. Local reporters in Miami came out and said, no idea why that's out. The MRI hasn't even happened. Then the agent for Jimmy Butler came out and said, no idea why that's out. We haven't even seen the doctor yet. We don't know. And only a few hours later, it was confirmed that the exact thing that Shams said turned out to be true. Was this a guess by Shams? What sources would he have had? Let me try to guess an SC, a Shams. Let me try to guess an SS, 
a Shams source. They told you that the MRI was scheduled for 3.30 the following day. When a player like Butler gets injured, goes back into the locker room, gets examined immediately. Eight out of 10 doctors surveyed. Top four answers on the board. How quickly can you discover what the injury is before you get the MRI? And how often are the doctors right before the MRI is done? More than 70%. Anecdotal, but I've had a lot of anecdotes. Doctors can look at a knee, they do all these tests, and they say, mm, that looks like MCL, not ACL. We're going to confirm it in the MRI. I'm trying to think of the number of times, and it's hundreds of MRIs that players got in my career, and the number of times that we were got the call with, oh my God, I had no idea. I can't believe that this is the case. It's like 5% of the time. Every other time we know exactly what the MRI is gonna show, we just do it for confirmation. Sometimes it doesn't work that way, but the majority of times it does. Do you think that Shams was just irresponsible in announcing something that he did not make up, that he got it from a source? And I'm not taking the side of media here, trust me. But I do know that local reporters don't like getting beaten by national reporters. Local reporters don't like it when the owner talks directly to national reporters and not local reporters. Agents don't like anybody talking to anybody unless they're the ones doing it. But Shams and other of these insiders who are paid millions of dollars, do you think their only source is one person inside the organization or one person outside the organization? These people have sources everywhere. He's not going to be irresponsible and give you a bit of news prematurely unless being right doesn't matter to the media anymore. And now it's just all about being first. Maybe for people building a career, that's the case. But when you've got the responsibility that Woj has or Shams or Passan or Rosenthal in baseball, or in football, the football insiders whose names are escaping me. Pelissaro, I believe, is one. Who's the main football insider, Coco, would you say, that you would give credit to as the number one NFL insider? Ah, Scheffler, of course. Rappaport and Schefter. Those would be two. You think they only have one source? Of course not. It made It was made to be such a huge deal yesterday when this report came out. And really, everyone just got beaten. Not the end of the world. All right, what do I think about the games? The Pelicans without Zion. Bad. Kings one and a half over the Pelicans. Zion, what he means to that team. Remember, this was a year that when he was on the court, he, he was a difference maker. He had a career high, I believe, or a season high before he even got hurt in the 7-8 game against the Lakers. And it was a pity that he left at 95 all. The Kings over the Pelicans. What about the Heat, Bulls, the Bulls who crushed the Hawks? How do you feel if you're the Hawks? Took Trey Young, you could have had Luka, did have Luka, traded him for Trey. And they're just year after year, year after year, nothing. The Bulls, Jerry Reinsdorf's got a big game tonight. All excited, I'm sure. There's something about Eric Spolster in the heat. When they have players injured, which is every single game, they still win games. We're taking the heat one and a half over the Bulls. We're taking the Kings one and a half over the Pelicans. I want to do a baseball pick as well here, Coca. Because tonight is an important night. Justin Verlander is back on the bump for the Houston Astros, and the Astros are reeling. My pick to win their division, they are bringing up the rear. They need Verlander back. He is minus 105 over the Nationals. We do not know exactly what he is going to bring to the table. My guess is you're looking at four to five innings, which apparently is what everybody throws these days, with very few exceptions. But there is something that happens inside a clubhouse when you see your ace or your erstwhile ace come back 
It changes your offense. It changes the mood. It just changes everything. And this is the change the Astros needed. Verlander over the Nationals. Those are the three picks. It would be nice to sweep so we can start the climb back to profitability. All right, when we come back, we're going to review the best documentary I've seen all year. And then I want to talk about a series that started in baseball. The Mets are playing the Dodgers. And it's a little different than you would have thought this series would be when the season started. And I'm excited to talk about the difference and see if you agree. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's a Friday show. It's David Sampson live. Monday will be a mailbag episode still at 8 a.m. Still be on DraftKings Network at 10. It'll be a mailbag episode as I try to potentially recover from potentially walking for potentially eight hours this coming Sunday in London as I try to complete the London Marathon. I don't know how it's going to work, Coca. It's been one hell of a month and every part of my body hurts. We had a great show in Pittsburgh. It was our fifth show of this month of this tour. We have one more show coming up in 10 days in New York. City Winer in New York, join us. Low ticket alert, go on their website. That was fun to see, Coca. It's been outstanding. I love it here in Pittsburgh, even though I have to leave and head to London right after the show to pick up my bib to tow the starting line on Sunday morning. What time am I starting, Coca? I am starting at 10.55 a.m., which is 5.55 a.m. East Coast time. So Sunday morning by 6 a.m., I will be in the back of the pack walking. Have an opportunity to watch plenty of movies, one per day, on the flight tonight. It's uh, eight hours of flying tonight. I'm going to watch a bunch of movies. I watched a two-part documentary called Steve Martin, a documentary in two pieces. This is a documentary that can be found on, I can't remember, Coca. I think it may be on Apple. For those of you who don't know Steve Martin, or think of him only as only murders in the building, or don't remember him as an amazing movie star, starting with The Jerk, going through Parenthood, going through Little Shop of Horrors, going, I, I could give you his whole IMDb page, which is code word when I say that for, I'm blanking on all the other movies he made that I loved. Shop Girl, amazing. But did you know that Steve Martin was one of the most famous and best known comedians of his time in the 70s? Granted, it's a long time ago. He had a level of fame as a comedian that you may see from Chappelle now, maybe Ricky Gervais, way more famous than let's say Pete Davidson. I'm trying to think of another who the most famous comedian would be right now performing. Steve Martin was bigger. He couldn't leave his house. The documentary goes through from those days how he then just quit comedy, which he did, to become a movie star. He wanted to change. He's an accomplished author. He's written incredible books, and I'm not a huge reader. I violate my New Year's resolutions every year because I read articles only and not books, but I've read his books. They're outstanding. He is an avid art collector. It is a fascinating portrayal of him. He lets you inside his life. There's a bunch of scenes that he shoots with Martin Short, his current partner, both touring. They tour together and in Only Murders in the Building when they're together with Selena Gomez in a nominated, if not award-winning show. And the reason why I'm going to ask you to allocate your time is that 50 years from now, when you are asked to watch a Taylor Swift documentary, I want you all to remember what Taylor Swift was today and how big she was. Can I say this? I think Sarah is going to hang up on me. Steve Martin was as big in his prime as Taylor Swift is now. And you're going to say no chance toilet pants. And I'm going to tell you, watch this documentary. It was a different world back then. Pre-social media, pre-cable. And when you talk about what it means where you can't walk one step, you're bigger than the Beatles. That's what Steve Martin was as this comedian. 
It's called the documentary in two pieces. That is a metaphor for his career. It's a metaphor for the number of episodes. Big series starting tonight. I mean, no big series happens in April. Let me say that better. 369-84. The Mets open up a three-game series against the Los Angeles Dodgers starting tonight. And I wanted to point out a couple of funny things that we would not have expected when the season opened only, well, almost a month ago for the Dodgers and about 22 days ago for everybody else. The New York Mets started 0-5, 0-6, and all of you assumed that they were finished and that they were going to lose 100 games. Coca already said he's finished for the year. All of his Mets friends were finished. Meanwhile, they're in an 8-2 and stretch, and now everyone's super excited because the Mets are 10-8, and and the feeling is, well, wait a minute, maybe they're going to overperform. And all this has been is me telling you that the beginning of the season is the same as the middle of the season or the end of the season. Every team has an 0-6 stretch, a 2-8 and stretch, a 9-1 and stretch, a 7-3 and stretch, a 3-7 and stretch. The Dodgers are in a 4-6 and stretch in their last 10 games. The Mets and Dodgers have very similar records. And I told you from the beginning with all the excitement of Betts and Freeman and Otani at the top of the lineup or Betts, Otani, Freeman, that I still like the Diamondbacks to win their division. I don't think the Dodgers pitching staff is going to carry them. Forget through October. It's going to have a hard enough time getting to October. Clayton Kershaw may come back. He was signed and getting paid, hasn't pitched yet. They're looking at a second half of the season as a way to save him so he's fresh for the playoffs. Give me a break. Ferris Bueller's pitching. He pitched for OKC last night. Walker had a terrible outing. Bobby Miller's hurt. Bueller's just coming back. And it turns out that the two most important pitchers for the Dodgers are Yamamoto and Tyler Glasnow, the same two who started the season in South Korea. Glasnow, who got rocked his last start, has no hit stuff every other start, has the ability to give up six runs like every other pitcher, or the ability to actually shove it for eight or nine innings. Yamamoto, in theory, is supposed to be that. I believe, Coca, that Yamamoto has yet to even throw a quality start yet this season. Six or more innings, three or fewer runs. Am I right about that with Yamamoto? And that's not exactly saying that he won't win Rookie of the Year, which I don't think he will. It's not saying that he's not worth $300 million. It is saying that for sure. What it's saying is that it's way too early to judge. But people are looking at this series and they're saying, look at the Mets, look at their bullpen. Diaz is back and he's dealing. Jorge Lopez, the castaway from the Twins and the Marlins, is having this amazing stretch right now. Reed Garrett, you never heard of him unhittable. Severino pitching the way he was supposed to pitch when the Yankees signed him. Finally healthy, I guess is the word you're going to use. Doing an outstanding job. How about Quintana? Another great starter. All these guys are all going five innings, might I add. So the stronger bullpen is going to be the stronger pitching staff because that's the case for every team in Major League Baseball. Your bullpen in April will not be your bullpen in September. That's the case for every team in baseball. But it's very striking that people were totally down on the Mets, totally up on the Dodgers, and now they're sort of in the same place. I wonder what that means for the rest of the season. I think the Mets can keep up with the Dodgers over the great equalizer of 162 games. There is a lesson to be learned here. And the lesson to be learned is try to just be smooth. As a fan, can you do it? So many fans are up and down and they're riding the roller coaster of emotions, the roller coaster of every 10 game stretch as though it is somehow impacting them, which I guess it was when my teams play badly. I was totally impacted before I got into the game. I would say just be calm. Oh, sorry, that was an all right again. Um, by the time I am back, we're going to have a live show on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. In theory, I'm going to be in Paris. And in theory, I will have done the marathon. And in theory, we're going to have Wi-Fi in the hotel. And in theory, we'll be live at 8 a.m. Eastern, which is 2 p.m. 
in Paris. We'll see how that all shakes out, but that is the plan. In the meantime, we'll have a mailbag on Monday. And by then, Coca, I will have jettisoned the verbal crutch of, all right, okay. You came up in Pittsburgh last night. I think we're going to release that show. There was a lot of talk about you, Coca, last night at the show. Just FYI. There was love for Sarah as well as having joined our team. But there was an unbelievable amount until I pointed out you're a West Virginia Mountaineer. And then it was crickets. Apparently, in Pittsburgh, they don't love West Virginia Mountaineers. Who knew? But by next week, no more all rights and okays. I'm not Matthew McConaughey. There is still developing stories from one of the worst acts of villainous, disgusting, vile, unacceptable behavior. And there is still news about Larry Nasser. Larry Nasser, you may remember, is the former National Women's Gymnastics team doctor. Larry Nasser is the guy who can't get violated enough in prison. He is the guy who abused gymnasts, little girls of all ages, sexually assaulted and abused them, will be in prison until he's a thousand years old, and that's not enough. The story that came out the other day, and there have been tons of lawsuits filed about this to everybody, to everywhere. There have been almost a billion dollars of payouts for the liability for what Nasser has done. And it's still not enough because there is no amount of money that ever makes up for pedophilia, sexual assault, sexual abuse. There was a settlement done by the U.S. Department of Justice. Our United States Department of Justice has paid about $100 million to 100 victims of Larry Nasser, And the reason they've agreed to pay the amount is, quote, over the FBI's failures to take seriously the reports brought to it of Nasser's potential abuse of star athletes. While we've covered this on previous Nothing Personals, I wanted to just remind everyone what happened here. There's great, there's stories about this. You can go read about it, you can watch. But the net net is that this was not done in silence. The whistle was blown on Nasser numerous times. There were numerous opportunities for him to be taken out of public circulation years before he actually was arrested. There was an opportunity to save hundreds of girls from being violated. If only the FBI had taken seriously any of these reports or any of these accusations. Why is it that the FBI would not assume when someone tells them something that it's real? There's a lot of cases like this that don't get press. There's a lot of situations where you're not going to read about it, where you're not going to see settlements that can reach almost a billion dollars. This is not, I want to, I want to make sure I frame this correctly. I am not excusing what happened to the FBI and what they did at all. This goes to a topic and a thought that I've had about things for a long time. Hindsight is always way more clear than foresight or even present sight. The FBI gets hundreds and thousands of leads, of inquiries, of issues to look at. Granted, this involves star athletes. Granted, this involves what to me, and I've told you this about pedophilia, I view it as the worst possible crime against another human being that you can do. Could the FBI have done more? There are settlements that say they could have. Did they purposefully do it? No. It is not as though that the agents who, when they're alerted to the concerns, and there are documentaries, there are articles that say they were dismissive. Articles that say they didn't believe it. They didn't want to follow up. They said they would follow up and didn't follow up. There's articles that will go through all sorts of levels of what 
becomes eventually liability. But in the legal world, it's important to note that when these settlements happen, when these lawsuits are taken, many of it is over what someone should have known versus what they did know. Many of them are over not what they should have known, not what they did know, what they could have known. There are different levels of negligence. There are different levels of just standard run of the mill. I'm ignoring you. I'm too busy trying to solve this. Isn't it the same in your life when you've got 10 things on your plate and one of them just you procrastinate enough and you don't solve it? And then you look back and you're like, my God, I should have paid attention to my toenail. I should have paid attention to that little backache. I should have paid attention to this piece of work that I didn't do and now I'm fired because it didn't get done. It happens to all of us because we all make choices with our time and with our allocated time. And the problem is that when you choose wrong, it can come back and not just haunt you, not just cost you, but it can change the lives of people impacted by your misallocation of time. Is this me? absolutely giving the FBI a pass? No, not at all. This is me trying to explain what happened, but also explaining why they paid the settlement they paid. This will mark the end, the absolute end of any lawsuits brought regarding Larry Nasser. He now hopefully will disappear into the ether and there is no more financial liability. And my only prayer and hope is that these gymnasts are able to somehow get the therapy, get the work needed to recover from the nightmare that was Larry Nasser. I want to end the show with something that you've all asked me to talk about uh, numerous times. And I've had it for a couple of days and we just haven't had time to get to it. There was a situation that happened in a game a couple of days ago where Boban, that amazing player for the Rockets, he purposely missed two free throws when they were playing the Clippers at the end of the regular season. And the free throws, by missing two free throws, it activated a promotion where all home team fans going to the Clipper game got a free chicken sandwich. And I've been asked a ton of, so you want to talk to Samson questions, a ton of people at David P. Samson on Twitter. And the reason I wanted to bring it up is that the road teams are always told about whatever promotions are. So for example, if there is something that a road player can do, hit a home run to a certain spot and win a car, is it just the home team? Is it the road team too? Is it the road team involving free throws? Is it the road team involving strikeouts? Whatever it is, we inform the other team what those promotions are. The Houston Rockets were aware about the free chicken sandwich, much like visiting players in Florida this year are aware of the free Whopper if they lose a game. None of it is a big deal and has not been a big deal for decades until now. My position on these types of promotions has completely changed. I do not think it's appropriate for there to be a promotion where you get a free chicken sandwich if the opposing team misses two free throws. And I don't mean over the game. It's one player missing two free throws. I'm all into rooting against the road team. Love it. I'm all into any sort of promotion that helps give money to a, to a team. Love it. But now that there is so much involvement with gambling, is it beyond the scale to believe, remember Tyler Hero's three pointer at the end of the game against whoever they against the Sixers, meaningless except it brought the game over instead of under. Is it possible when you miss two free throws purposely the way Boban did? What's how close are you to point shaving? People are going to say, David, you're completely overreacting. Are you sure? Because missing two free throws purposefully is missing two points. But he's going to say, the first one I tried to make, once I missed the first one, I said, screw it. Let's give everyone free chicken. I'm going to be a hero. And so he was a hero. But the thing is that teams are going to keep doing these promotions. Players are going to keep having fun with it until the rules change. Because until then, it's just business. 
We'll be back Monday with a mailbag live on Tuesday. This is nothing personal.